You're listening to The Big Cast, your source for the latest in financial technology. Brought to you weekly by the Best Innovation Group with your hosts, John Best and Glenn Servati. Welcome to another edition of The Big Cast. My name is Glenn Servati. On behalf of the Best Innovation Group, where we like to do cool things with financial technology. And today we've got, I don't know what else to call it, uh, but a very disturbing but important and enlightening conversation. Roger Grimes, who is a noted um, cyber security expert, uh, joined our CU town hall a couple of weeks ago, had a great conversation, and I'll get into the specifics around ransomware attacks, and shared a ton of great information, some data, some personal experience of how he's dealt with these things in the past. And uh, the whole town hall is out there for anybody who wants to listen, and we'll post a link to it. But we're taking the greatest hits, kind of the the highlights of what he had to say that I think really deserves your attention. Uh, and we're going to be uh, kind of cobbling those together with the, you know, the excerpts of the highlights of that one coming up for you here on the Big Cast this week. Again, you can always find out more about the Best Innovation Group, big-fintech.com. And we've uh, always got new content here every Tuesday and also the CU Town Hall. Uh, There is another one coming up tomorrow. If you listen to this right when it posts, uh, the next CU Town Hall will be on Wednesday, August 7th. That happens at 3. That's live and lively and interactive. I stress that. I mean, if you want to come and listen, you can come and listen. We prefer that you come and participate because it's supposed to be an open forum and a sharing of best practices. 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. You do need to register in advance. There's no cost to register, but we do need to uh, monitor who's on there and send you a link so you can join. Uh, we got the topic set already for this one on August 7th. Uh, it is the primary financial institution designation. Uh, very common concept in terms of thinking about how engaged your members or customers, if you're a bank, tend to be. Uh, and how you would actually define who is treating your institution as their primary institution. And the question that came up uh, in one of the conversations in the last town hall is, is that still a relevant concept with the way the world's changed and money moves so quickly and instant payments says you can move things back and forth and transfer them to different holding pens, etc. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more, an hour's worth more. So if uh, if you want to join us on the 7th, or if you're listening to this afterwards, you can go out to cutownhall.com, listen to the replay. But uh, cutownhall.com is also the place for you to request an invite if you'd like to join us live. A couple of current event items we want to make sure we cover before we get on to our primary topic. Just this morning, breaking news, uh, NCR Voyix, who we have spoken to before on this podcast, and uh, that you're probably quite familiar with, uh, providers of digital banking solutions that I'm sure several of the credit unions listening are using in their shops, has just agreed to be taken private for $2.5 billion by Veritas Capital. This is kind of a continuing saga. We spoke with uh, Doug Brown, the president of NCR Voyex, uh, last October, I believe it was, not long after the NCR Corporation broke up into two separate public companies, uh, NCR Atlios, which ran the ATM business, and NCR Voyex, which took on the digital banking and point-of-sale restaurant retail services businesses. That involved a lot of debt being taken on. And as I understand it, what this basically does is free up uh, a lot more working capital for the ongoing Voyex business, which will be primarily the restaurants, the retailers, the the point of sale stuff, uh, and uh, takes the uh, the piece that uh, most directly relates to credit unions, uh, the Voyex uh, digital banking platform into a private state, uh, and presumably will help uh, free up some additional uh, investment capital for them as well. Uh, These kind of things always have a a lot of uh, moving parts to them, and this is brand new news, so we will be following up on that as more information comes about. We'll also post a link to that conversation we had with Doug Brown, obviously not entirely current, it's about nine months old, but it reflected where the business was when they broke into two separate uh, public companies and really gave a pretty good sense of the vision for NCR Voyex, which at least given that I was speaking to the digital banking head, Uh, for that piece of the business, I'm assuming probably stays relatively consistent with where they'll they'll be going under private ownership. The other one that I wanted to touch base on really quickly, the Bitcoin 2024 conference a couple weekends ago in Nashville, Tennessee. Donald Trump made some pretty big headlines with his appearance there and some conversations, uh, you know, promises, statements that he made which pretty much reflected a 180 from his position on Bitcoin back when he was in office from 2016 to 2020. 
Um, I would characterize this as uh, pandering to single issue voters. I don't really know what else to call it. The kind of promises or representations he made, again, I can't think of a better word than incoherent. It, 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 we, when you try to bundle them all together, they don't make a lot of sense. Good friend of mine, Jeff Gapuson, who I'm down here in Atlanta, who does uh, uh, an ongoing column for Forbes uh, magazine on the digital side. I'll post a link. He was actually there in person and wrote a really great write-up, not only about uh, Donald Trump's comments, but more broadly about the event. Uh, he titled it, I thought quite cleverly, When Rage Became the Machine, uh, as compared to you know the band Rage Against the Machine and uh, the, the mainstreaming, to some extent, of the, uh, the Bitcoin mentality. Um, part of this was the idea that Donald Trump floated of creating a strategic reserve for the government to hold Bitcoin. Um, he also talked about it as a, a need to kind of defend against the fact that the China did not become the superpower for cryptocurrency. Uh, the, the weird part to me is this seems to go into a lot of areas that's pretty much anathema uh, to the traditional angle around Bitcoin. Um, one of the things he talked about, the strategic reserve, the petroleum reserve, the gold reserve, it goes in and out. You, depending on the market situations, you're actually looking to capitalize on lower prices, prop up prices when things are in, in a, a matter of shortage, you sell them. Uh, his point was never sell Bitcoin. He was very clearly in the HODL camp, which was not true when he was in office in 2016 through 2020. That's not a strategic reserve, as far as I can tell, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the Wall Street Journal kind of pointed out it didn't make, didn't make a lot of sense. The Cato Institute, another conservative group, uh, pointed out it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, representative made the, the comment, it seems like the basic idea is reduce the supply of Bitcoin to try to prop up the price. You would think that if the government was getting into moving it and creating a reserve, that's exactly the idea of why Bitcoin was created, to keep the government from doing those types of things. Anyway, that enough of that. I just thought that was a really interesting twist. We also posted a link to Reuters, and they had some things to say about it, particularly with regard to the angle from China, which again didn't make a lot of sense given that China is actually cracking down on the use of Bitcoin. On to our main event, and uh, just setting the stage for this one again, We uh, and if you go back to the town hall, you'll hear more about this if you listen to the full episode. Again, if you go out to our show notes, you'll find a link to it. If you go to the cutownhall.com website, you'll find a link to it. This conversation really kind of got its origins by the ransomware situation and the hit that Patelco Credit Union out in California took recently. Um, that was the reason that we actually had the conversation. This is not in any way meant to cast any aspersions on Patelco, and I think John takes pains to mention that. Um, as of July 17th, and I've double-checked this with a few different sources, our friends at uh, CU Today, uh, and also the, the Patelco website itself, uh, the last update there, as of July 17th, they have finally managed to bring most of their functionality back. Their online systems were totally out. People could not access their funds. They were running basically kind of workarounds for some time. Most of the functionality is back. Um, we'll, again, post a link to this, but uh, you can see what is still unavailable. Uh, the branches and call centers are still somewhat limited in what they could do. But the, the majority of what people really need to do on a day-to-day -day basis is back in action. You can't do cash advances. You can't get instant card issuance. You can't get statement copies or e-statements. At the end of the day, you know, those aren't, uh, they're inconvenient, but they're not going to stop the world. Um, a couple things you can't do still that are still shut down are new loan applications and new account applications. And I don't know if they have a workaround for that or not, but at least in terms of the online approach to it, that's, that's pretty disturbing. I'm kind of curious how, what that's going to look like in the long run. Uh, our friends at CU Today uh, mentioned that I was trying to figure out if this was isolated to Patelco. It does seem to have been a targeted attack on them. Uh, in the same window of time, there were a couple credit unions that took outages via the CrowdStrike situation that has affected airlines and things like that. But no other ransomware attacks that uh, we're aware of over that, uh, that window of time. Had a good conversation about this uh, after the fact uh, with John Best. Again, we're kind of updating things that have happened since this original conversation that took place on the town hall. And John really stresses, as you'll hear on this, if this can happen to Patelco, who runs, as he said, a very tight ship, this can happen to anybody. Um, and the question in his mind is, are we at halftime? Or is this more the two-minute warning that we're getting close to the end? And that may be true for Patelco itself, if there's another shoe to drop, as well as the industry as a whole, once there's been some level of success. 
But some of the stuff that Roger had to talk about, and he knows a lot of this stuff, uh, working now with the company Know Before, but he's got tons of experience in the space and has written a book on, on the whole topic of ransomware. We'll post a link to that as well. Um, you know, he's, he's got some pretty uh, very enlightening but also worrisome comments. But uh, with no further ado, let's have a listen to uh, some of that conversation with Roger Grimes. The uh, first question, Juan and I were debating on for a $9.67 billion institution, how much do you think they were asking for the initial ransomware? And, and by the way, this doesn't have to be Patelco, but any, any bank. I looked at Evolve Bank, uh, which we have a, a couple slides on here in a minute, but what do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, on what you know, you're the expert. Yeah, there's figures all over the place, but I would say this, that uh, Marsh Insurance has some really good figures out for 2023 and that the medium ransom demand in 2023 was 20 million dollars the medium and ransomware payment if someone paid it was 6.5 million dollars so uh you know it used to be that and today 80 percent 75 to 80 percent of ransomware payments are above a million uh but less people are paying it 13 to 28 percent of the victims are paying it now so far less people are paying it uh, but when they do pay, it's usually many, many millions and many tens of millions. Again, Marsh Insurance said the average was $20 million. Agreed. Wow. And so that was, uh, I, I was looking at a ransomware that got paid. It was a hospital system from the Black Suit Group, and it was right around that number. Um, you know, and on top of that, what they pointed out in the article, and I think you were alluding to this, is um, that even though the company paid it and they said they would not leak the information, they, they uh, one, they still had to act like they did leak the information. They had to take all the legal, um, they had to take all the legal steps that had to be taken for um, as though the information was leaked regardless of whether they paid it or didn't pay it. So uh, that was um, interesting to me. Um, yeah, many many times the, be... ransom, the ransomware groups will place it in a location and then they won't publicly release it, but it's really a publicly accessible location anyways, and they don't delete it. They just don't go out of their way to quote unquote release it. So a lot of times when you pay, they're not deleting the information. That's something I've always told people, if you're actually gonna pay it, uh, you, you need to somehow confirm that the information is, you know, if you can, then you need to force the ransomware groups to go the extra mile and actually delete the information. Yeah, yeah. Like prove it somehow, right? And yeah, and, the, and, and do the you change, think there's any hope of that, dude? Yeah, the Change Healthcare one was wild because Change Healthcare, you know, the pharmacy group, or whatever, paid 25 million, and then the person they paid the money to didn't give any of it to the ransomware group. Like the affiliate took all the money, and then the ransomware group that kind of provides the ransomware said, "Well, we're, we didn't get our 10 or 20 percent oh cut, gosh. so we want another." 10 20 million so they ended up paying once if not twice i don't know if they ever paid the second one but they actually got double extorted uh, kind of from the same event uh which is wild to pay 20 25 million and and that's not enough i want to set some context uh, in between over here we kind of jumped topics for a second we're going to rejoin when we were talking about the saudi aramco outage in case people don't remember there was a pretty significant outage that hit the saudi aramco oil petroleum manufacturing site uh, operation, um, which was attributed to what was called the Shamoon virus or Shamoon ransomware uh, that they believe originated out of Iran. Time flies by. That feels to me like it didn't happen that long ago. When I looked it up, it was actually 2012. So it's been a dozen years since this happened. So just for context, that's what we're going to be hearing about next. I worked the attack when I was at Microsoft. Yeah, you want to talk about it a little bit? So they, they found them. And they had that wiper program. Why don't you take it from there? Yeah, and let me say wiper programs are becoming a bigger thing since then. But this was actually the, so you had Saudi Aramco, you know, one of the largest companies in the world, the largest company, oil company in Saudi Arabia. They had, Saudi Arabia had attacked Iran and some affiliates. And this was kind of the response that came back from Iran, from Iranian nation state attackers. And they, 
we're able to place wiperware. So that's, you know, malware that when it goes off, it, it, it will either format your hard drive, format your boot sector, format your fat table, depends on what each wiperware does different sorts of things, but they'll essentially make your, your hard drive, your storage media unreadable. Uh, and then, you know, on that day at Saudi Aramco, they, and let me say they had almost no cybersecurity controls at all. It was not hard. They were reusing passwords, hard coded passwords on the software hadn't been patched in five years. It literally was a horrible state because they felt somewhat, uh, you know, that they weren't getting attacked and they didn't need to do, you know, let me say in general, the United States is among the most aggressive in cybersecurity controls and defenses. And when you go out into other countries, they, they're not as strict. They're not, you know, so like I know when I'm going to India, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, that I'm, if I think America's bad, you know, America looks like this gleaming diamond <laughs> of an example compared to the companies right. like in foreign countries. And so that's what happened to Saudi Arabia is they, they had this wiper where it actually put, you know, a message on people's screens and then it formatted, you know, or, or, or I forget whether it's the fat table or whatever. Um, and, and it was it was so tremendous, you know, it brought down the company, it brought down the country's main source of revenue. And the I got bought in, uh, brought in because I was to train Saudi Aramco people. So we were part of the incident response. And then I my part was more of, hey, can you teach some about how to secure Active Directory, secure Windows, that sort of stuff. So they actually had a lot of people on their teams come shadow us for six months. You know, they, they're like, how can we quickly find out how to do it right? You know, uh, so and, and let me say a lot, a lot of countries uh, did that. I, I did the same thing actually for Huawei in China. Uh, you know, although it's funny, you know, in China, I remember I would tell them, they're like, do you all use firewalls at Microsoft? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, oh, what type of firewall, mm -hmm. what your firewall rules and where are they located? I'm like, uh, yeah, and, uh, I think you, uh, and, I, and I remember I was like, I think you have to talk to uh, Todd Thompson at Microsoft, and they immediately all stopped and wrote down his name. <laughs> and I, I literally said, if you're wow. trying not to seem like spies, y'all shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be asking these yeah, sort of you're questions. you're not doing a great job of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was like, I think so, they were just trying to say, if we're doing it right, we should follow what Microsoft's doing. But it, it was some, it could be misconstrued other ways. They were in this system for some time. Then somebody, and by the way, while they were in there, they were fixing things. Like if something broke, they didn't want to get found out. So they'd go and fix it for you. If your firewall wasn't working right and they could get in there and fix it, they'll do it because they don't want any attention brought to them. Yeah, they were someone actually, finally discovered they them were and then kicking, they, yeah. they were actually kicking out other hacker groups. <laughs> yeah, they were fighting off other people that were in there. Yeah, and they were then actually they, the they were patching. Not they only, were patching things. I was like, if your hacker group's yep. patching your systems better than you are, <laughs> you have a problem. Right. <laughs> and, and so my point is, is that we sit here and we think that we're okay because we haven't had the the screen pop up with the Bitcoin address and the ransomware. But it's worrisome that you know the 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 what Roger's saying is. Of the, like the majority of the time, they are in there long before the the, the ransomware trigger is pulled. Yeah, although um, obviously the, the and, dwell time the dwell time has significantly decreased. Dwell time a year or two ago was six to eight months. I've known of companies that were compromised for years. The dwell time is now measured in days to weeks. Um, it's uh, the, they're the ransomware and not necessarily because they have to be because they have a worry of detection, but just because they're taking more aggressive action because they're making more money, right? You don't want to leave 10, $20 million on the table when you can take care of this problem today. Back when it was 10,000, $13,000, maybe there was no rush. Uh, and they had so many targets these days, there's less people paying, uh, even though they're compromising more people. Uh, and they, you know, they need to very quickly determine, is this person going to pay or not? Are they one of the people that are going to pay or one of the people that are not going to pay? Because if not, we're going to move on to the next target and, you know, make 10, 20 million dollars. I would say the Verizon data breach report for a decade has shown that the vast majority of people are told by outside parties when they're compromised and they themselves don't detect it. Something like 70 to 90 percent of people. This figure doesn't change much year to year, but you can go to, to this year's Verizon data breach report and it will show you that external people are the people most likely to tell you that you're compromised.
if it's not, you know, if it's not ransomware or ransomware going on. Let me say certain industries actually had the industries decided they're not going to pay the ransom at all. And so that makes that target less likely to be targeted. Uh, and then other people, uh, most of the time they're finding out by the response, right? The the ransomware goes off and then they get a particular response or something like that. They also, of course, is trying to say, can I, can, you know, how how badly can I take down this company They'll not only take down the, the internals of the company, but they'll do a distributed denial of service attack to take their website off the internet as well. So they're, 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 you know, there's no way for that company to hide that they're having a problem. And they're trying to put maximum pressure, but they really don't know till they make that, you know, till the letter comes out and they find out from the first or, you know, from the, the people, you know, are they going to negotiate or not? And, and that figure, again, is going lower and lower and lower. Uh, the highest figure I've seen is 28% of the victims are paying. The lowest figure is 13%. So, you know, let's say a quarter of people, 15% to a quarter of the people are paying. And again, I, you know, at least when I've seen in ransomware negotiations, the company, you know, within a day or so is kind of decided, are we going to pay or not? And then after that, it's negotiations. Wiperware is making a comeback. And every once in a while, you'll get a, what looks like a ransomware attack, and it really is a wiperware attack. It typically is coming from Russia. But just know that that's one of the first things, and it's in my book on ransomware, is you need to quickly decide, is this really a ransomware attack or a wiperware attack? Because uh, both Russia and to a lesser extent, Iran will sometimes, they'll, it, they'll make you think it's a, a ransomware attack. And during that, they're wiping as much data as possible. So one of the first things you need to do is go, hey, does it really look like the files are encrypted or are things being uh, you know, deleted instead? So is that what you mean by wiperware? Yeah. It's, it, it's a delete instead of, uh, a, instead of an encryption for ransom? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Most of them are formatting the what's called the FAT table or the partition table. Master boot record. Yeah, but the, so the difference, you know, the master boot record, the difference is if it's a ransomware attack, you're literally going to, usually they're going to put the document on your screen. And when you go look at the files, you'll see that the files have been renamed because they're encrypted, but you yeah. can still see the files on the hard drive, even though they're not functioning. And a wiperware attack, your disk is saying, you know, invalid disk or something like that. So my question there, though, is if that's not ransomware, I mean, what what's the upside for the hacker? Uh, I mean, uh, it's, do, do it's, they put it back, or <laughs> what? What are what are they going for? Are they just looking for chaos? Yeah, I mean, usually it's a nation state attack. Uh, like Russia recently did wiperware. I say recently, the beginning of the Ukraine war against uh, American and Elon Musk satellites, and you know they had they had Musk pay. So that they wouldn't, you know, or not promise not to use his satellites uh, over Ukraine. Uh, but it's been in uh, other places. Maybe you don't pay the ransom, so they're going to pay you back by sending wiperware instead. So you like, so at first it's ransomware, and then you say uh, we're not going to pay, and it, they they initiate the wiperware portion of their program. Yeah, today ninety six percent of ransomware groups will try to corrupt the backups if they can get to them. Um, 96%, so almost all of them, right? It's like only the stupid ones <laughs> aren't doing it. Uh, yeah, so only you, the 4%, you know. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's usually this Iranian group that just does this simple stuff. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for your backups, you, you need to be making sure, they call it the 3 two, one system, that you have three backups of all data, and that one of the backups is the actual data where it exists, and then two are somewhere else. And one of those should be offline. And by offline, I mean that you cannot get to it. On, I, I oftentimes ask people, oh, is your backup, do you have one of them at least offline? And they're like, yes. And I say, can you get to that offline backup from an online console to restore? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, it's not offline then. Offline means it, offline. Takes a, yeah. it takes a physical action to get that data back online. And uh, these days it's easier for them to corrupt the backups because we have more and more virtual machines and the backup sometimes is another set of systems of virtual machines that are cloning that activity. But people don't realize when you encrypt the data here, it encrypts the data there. Uh, and it's easier for them to get access to the data backup system. So you really do need to protect your, your backups as best you can. It should be protected by uh, you know, uh, phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. Um, and, you know, and the idea is that it, you have to have a recent backup that's offline, truly offline, 
because again, 96 percent of the time they're trying to get to your backups. You know, the sneakiest ones were the ones that were changing the encryption keys on the data backup. So mo today, most backups have an encryption key on it to protect the data. And we had uh, some, you know, these ransom groups would just change your encryption key. So you would back up your, all your data, including offline. And then when you went to go restore it, it didn't work because it wasn't your encryption key. So you didn't realize it had been dwelling. It changed your encryption key. So now even your offline backups, even your backups from 30 days ago, unaccessible. There are a lot of people on this call, which is awesome. Um, what are the top things that they need to, and could do right now or should have done Given that, it, like I said, I'm here to tell you, I know for a fact the telco is a well-run and well-managed company, uh, credit union, and so if they got hit, all of us are at risk. What are the top three, five things people can do? So, yeah, I've got five um, that I, I share with everybody. I scream in as loud as I can. 70 to 90 percent of successful data breaches are due to social engineering. So whatever you can do, including having good defenses against that, having policies that try to prevent that, and education. Uh, and I would say that education means that you're offering training to your employees once a month and doing simulated phishing once a month. Uh, number two, Mandiant, owned by Google, says that 33% uh, of data breaches involve unpatched software and firmware. So make sure you're patching the stuff that's on the CISA Kev list uh, CISA, the Cyber Cyber Infra, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, CISA.org, or gov, gov uh, has a list known as the Known Exploited Vulnerability Catalog. If you have software or firmware that's on that list, get it patched ASAP. And one of the, I just wrote an article this morning, it's on my LinkedIn, that attackers are now using, I call them one days, forget about the zero days, it's the one day attacks. The attackers are now seeing CISA list, uh, you know, a really, you know, hey, there's a new uh, exploit being exploited with Move It, and the uh, ransomware people are within a day or two or three, or certainly within a few weeks, attacking thousands of customers using a known vulnerability. So your patching window has significantly decreased. We're not talking weeks anymore. We're talking in days. That if there's something that's on the CISA known exploited vulnerability catalog list, get it patched within days. Scott, you raised your hand for something. Yeah, I was going to share, <clears throat> and I'm a novice at all of the security stuff, so I appreciate your hearing you today, Roger. But I did want to pass along. I heard in a casual conversation uh, with someone that works at a large bank. They send out regular, uh, I guess, emails to their employees and try to get them to uh, click on something they're not supposed to. Uh, one of them in particular that was highly effective talked about an error in the in their bonus rate or it had something to do with their wages. So apparently that was something that most people were like, yeah, I want to see that. Yeah, what, uh, we, we say be careful of that because you can make enemies of your employees. Uh, <laughs> So be careful, like the the hey, there's a you got a bonus or there a raise or something. I, I say that if a real attacker has used that against your company, it's fair game. But otherwise than that, you're going to create more enemies, and you want to encourage people to want to be involved in the education and that. So you're 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 not if you're making enemies and pissing people off, you're not doing cybersecurity education right. So, but again, if the attacker uses that and offered that in real life, fair game. Uh, so uh, social engineering, patching. Social engineering and patching are about 99% of the problem. So if you really, and if you understand what I just said, that is really the whole ball of wax. And everything, everything else that you can be compromised equates to about 1% of the risk. But going further... You're going to have to use, so you have multi-factor authentication. It should be phishing resistant, like FIDO, F-I-D, F-I-D-O, something like that. You want phishing resistant MFA. Otherwise, your MFA can be socially engineered and phished just like a password. You should use password managers so that you, for all the passwords that you need, the password manager can create and use strong passwords. If you have to create a password out of your own head because you can't use a password manager or MFA, then that password, if you want it to be truly secure against hackers, it should be 20 characters or longer. And what we mean is a passphrase. People go, 20 characters? Yes. I have friends who routinely 
every day break 18 character passwords. But as far as we know, there's is publicly system. When I was telling Jen Easterly this, my thing, hey, use 20 character passwords, she didn't go good recommendation. She was, I noticed that she was quiet when I said use 20 character passwords, which means maybe CIS is breaking that. Maybe the NSA and CIS are breaking 20 character passwords. But publicly, we don't know of any technology that can break a 20 character password, whether or not it has complexity or not. But you should use a password manager because they'll create truly random a truly random password with a bunch of gobbledygook in it. It becomes unhackable, uncrackable at around 11, 12 characters. But things out of our head, like Roger jumps over the blue cow, needs to be 20 characters long. So fight social engineering, patch your software quickly, especially the stuff on the CISA Kev list, known exploitive vulnerability catalog list. Use phishing resistant multi-factor authentication where you can. If you have to use passwords and you will have to use passwords, you should use a password manager. The one that I people ask me, which one do you love the most? There's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, I'm personally a fan of one password, but there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, and then uh, lastly, teach yourself and your coworkers how to spot rogue URLs. You know, know the difference between an uh, email link that really is from Microsoft and not from Microsoft. That's a good skill to have. And I tell people, if you, anytime you get a message that's unexpected, so you were not expecting it, I don't care how it comes, if it's an email, uh, it's a text message, someone calls you. If you get a message that was unexpected, you were not expecting it, and it's asking you to perform an action that you have never performed before, slow down and research that independently by calling a known good phone number, by, you know, emailing, uh, you know, a company or corporate address or whatever. Literally, that is 99% of phishing, which is 79% of the problem, is literally teaching yourself, hey, that's weird. Hey, that's a new unexpected request. I've never had that request before. Slow down. It, it, that would take and, care of 99% right. of fishing. So again, as you heard from John, this is not at all meant to be, you know, a negative toward Patelka. I, my heart goes out to them because this can happen to anyone, as John said. Um, they've hopefully done a good bit of recovering, but it's going to be a real interesting road to see what happens. I hope the NCUA, and I hate to think about it this way, but I hope this should be a real good case study to see what happens over time. As we talked about, Patelco was sitting north of nine billion in assets. Um, I'm really curious to see when we get to September 30th what their asset base looks like, what, what how people reacted to this. Did this erode people's trust in the institution? Did it cause people to just get comfortable once, uh, once they got access to their money again? Uh, is there going to be other issues with uh, data leaks and things like that? It'll be, uh, this is not the end of the story. I'm sure this is one we're going to be following for some time. And I think it's going to be very instructive to see how this goes. So we'll be, we'll be definitely following along. With that, another episode of the Big, uh, Big Cast in the Books. Again, my name is Glenn Sarvati. Uh, you can track me down via my firm, 154 Advisors, on LinkedIn or on X, where I tweet at 154 Advisors. I still call it tweeting. I'm sorry. I'm not going to apologize for that. You can find our grand poobah, John Best, out there as well under at JB Fintech or the Best Innovation Group overall at Big Fintech. Uh, you'll also find them, as I said before, on the website or on LinkedIn, also a great place to find out more about what's going on. Again, the website, big-fintech.com. Uh, you'll find out more about the great products and services covering AI, AI voice recognition, et cetera. Uh, that uh, is available through the Best Innovation Group for credit unions and fintechs as well. Um, and we always love to hear from you. We, if you check on the media tab, you'll find a vast archive of past episodes. Uh, we'll have new content again next Tuesday. Always love to hear from you. So if you don't uh, run into us live on the town hall coming up tomorrow, August 7th, uh, again, cutownhall.com if you want to get a, an invitation and register for that. Uh, but again, it's at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern, noon Pacific. Always catch the replays of those at cutownhall.com as well. Or check in wherever you get your podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Uh, subscribe, like, whatever you happen to do to set reminders to get the new content when it comes out. And as always, thanks for listening.
Check back each week for the latest from the big cast. Or better yet, we hope you'll consider subscribing for free via Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at Big Fintech, email info at big-fintech.com, or visit us at big-fintech.com and click on the media tab where you can post a comment or check out our archive of hundreds of past episodes. See you next week.